Hello, everyone. This is Live Life Well TV host Robert Landau with another episode of Meet Your RCM Executive Staff. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Kendra Lawson. Kendra is the Chief Operating Officer of RCM. Kendra, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me, Robert. Oh, hey, thanks for, for joining us. So, uh, let's start with some preliminary questions first. Where <laughs> were you raised? So, I was raised in Commerce, Texas, which is a northeast town. Um, most people knew it with East Texas State University, pretty much a university town, and now it is Texas A&M Commerce. So. Excellent. And brothers, sisters? So I have um, one biological brother, um, and my grandparents were from Commerce, and then my, my dad and my brother still live there, and my mother lives in Greenville. So uh, where is Commerce? So Commerce is um, in um, Northeast Texas. So um, if you're familiar with Greenville, Paris, Texas, kind of going on that I-30 corridor towards uh, Texarkana about halfway, uh, between Dallas and I don't know, going towards Texarkana. So Mount Pleasant, Mount Vernon, that kind of area. Okay, great. I got it. Yep. Yeah. Concerning your childhood, Kendra, um, was there one thing or were there some things that were instilled in you at an early age that you, you still not only remember to this day, but kind of uh, maybe still live by? Oh, absolutely. Um, so just from the flavor and how I got into the industry was when I was seven, my, my grandfather was um, the only dentist in town uh, way back in the day. We won't say how long ago. Um, <laughs> and um, there were two nursing homes there and they went bankrupt. So my grandfather and the local physician bought the nursing home. My dad ran it. Um, as the administrator, and my mother, who um, had a degree in art and was a kindergarten teacher, decided to become the activity director. So from the time that I was seven, I spent every day in both of those nursing homes after school and summer. So honestly, my, my parents instilled a very good work ethic. Um, I think they violated every child labor law. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was that was out there um but i i really grew up serving seniors and that was my normal that was my my world so i didn't really know um any anything different so that's where my comfort has always been i love it i mean really in many ways that paved the way for, for what you're doing now and that started at age seven yep so I assume you spent a bit of time at, at those communities or at that community. Right. So um, either through volunteering, um, people that are, are my age and, and older, I don't know when they stopped it, but had candy stripers. Um, so that was volunteers. Um, so I was a candy striper and we used to pass ice um, down the halls. We would take out goodies. Um, they would let me help serve in the dining room and um, get coffee for the residents, and then loved the arts and crafts. So my mom um, had a resident group and volunteers. They make quilts for all the residents. Um, so, um, you know, it was, it was just flavor. That was just day-to-day -day life was going and serving others. And with my dad on, on the floor all the time, those nurses um, really nursed me um, and taught me. And then I became a caregiver um, as soon as I was old enough. Um, and so when I went off to college, of course, I wanted to do anything but work in a nursing home. Um, I wanted to do something glamorous like work at a bank and um, maybe be a flight attendant. So went off to college and I got a job as a part-time drive-through teller in a bank. And I was shocked at the reality of customer service. So I was very used to people thinking I was just the cutest thing since sliced bread. Um, when I get to the bank, I'm getting screamed at because people can't add and subtract in their checkbook. <laughs> I'm to blame. Um, and so that tender heart of me just didn't know how to get yelled at, um, you know, uh, in, in the bank. And so what I, what I found 
was those customers that were our seniors um, that came through the drive-through, um, you know, were the ones that I had patients. They could yell and scream at me all they wanted, and I didn't care. I was going to help them. Um, and I remember one gentleman, his name was Jack. I remember him to this day. And Commerce is a very small town. Everybody knows each other. And he had had a stroke and he was no longer able to walk into the bank and he would go to the bank every Friday because back then you got your social security check. Um, and he would only come in on the first Friday of every month typically and deposit that check. So when he couldn't come into the bank anymore, he would drive through, which is how I really got to know him. And he had a Lincoln Continental that was the size of a bus. <laughs> it was like a 78 um, Lincoln Continental baby blue. I'll never forget it. Um, and he's the reason why they put those big concrete things outside the brick columns at the bank. Cause we would literally lay down a dollar and bet every time he came through the drive through if he was going to hit the brick <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and nobody ever really got upset if he nipped the, the brick and he would come through every Friday and he would try to cash checks that were non-negotiable. Um, so publisher's clearing house, Jack, I can't give you $3 million. <laughs> <laughs> then he would just, you know, it was an outing. It was to come out, have that connection with people, even though he knew we weren't going to be able to cash that check. Um, and so a few Fridays, he didn't come in to the drive through So, you know, I, I called my dad and said, you know, hey, you know, do, do you and granddaddy know where Jack is? Because he hasn't come in. Can you go check on him? And sure enough, he had had a health incident. He was in the hospital in Dallas. Um, fast forward probably months later, he ended up moving um, into our family's nursing home. And so I started going back in to visit him and volunteering. So ultimately, long story is that was really my aha moment that said, I don't, I don't belong in a bank. I like that job. I like working with, with um, business and finances, but I want it for a purpose. Um, and I want to help people. So changed my degree and got my degree in um, long-term care and aging and went back and started running nursing homes. I, I love it because uh, for those that believe that our footprints might be kind of set for us, kind of before we step into them, it seems to me, based on what you're sharing with us, that um, somebody, was telling you that uh, the senior market was what you sort of came here for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So it, it's just, you know, it's, it's either how the stars and the moon aligned. Um, so um, my, my, one of my brother, um, he actually does the landscaping for my parents' properties. Um, so, you know, there's, you know, it just, it really instills you in kind of that small town feeling where, you know, our reputation was everything. Um, and we were taking care of our neighbors and my grandparents' best friends. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's not an empty name on that door. And I think that's what I carry here with me is whether I work in my family's business or where I, I work at RCM, um, you know, my, my husband's work and it, it brought us to Houston. Um, is that I take that very personally and my name is on it and in every one of our communities um, my legacy is there and if I leave it a better place than I found it then I hope that that is is you know what I'm known for and then what our residents and our staff um, and employees will benefit from mm, I love that I love that and you had that instilled it was kind of like in your DNA I mean even when you went away from the industry and you, you did the, the drive-through teller thing. Uh, one of the most um, heart-moving, impressive things that occurred to you during that period of time was the senior with the huge Lincoln. I remember those Lincolns. They were like, <laughs> I mean, my God, they were like a cruise ship or something, you know? And thank God he had that because if he had had a Volkswagen Beetle, it, when he kept hitting the curve when he was coming up to do business with you from the, the window or whatever, there would have been nothing left of his car. So I can see he had to have a huge <laughs> tank because he needed that kind of armor every time he would come up to your window. But see, even then, uh, it, it, it was like you were being told, 
senior market, senior market, and, and your heart was always there and, and came back. Um, so just before you, you joined RCM, you started to speak about after the bank, you went back into the, the senior retirement right. community industry. And so what was that specifically? Um, so I, I didn't really know at that time. Um, I just knew that if I wanted to be a nursing home administrator like my dad, there was a set plan and program that you had to follow. So the first thing was finding a university that supported that. Um, so at that time, I was doing some of my undergrad work at East Texas State, which was in Commerce where I was. Um, so of course, I'm ready to spread my wings and leave the family. Um, and North Texas State University, which is now University of North Texas, um, had one of the first uh, gerontological programs um, in the state. And it, it's still renowned um, now. I'm so proud of that, um, that legacy and that program. Um, so um, when I did that, they only had the master's program. So they did a special um, education. So I actually got my bachelor's in it, but I had to take some of the master level courses in order to get that core curriculum. Um, so while I was there, um, the, the professors, I was blessed to have two or I think three professors that really um, took an interest in me. Um, and so then you could do internships, if you will. So I did one at the Jewish Home for the Aged in Dallas, and that was a real um, great opportunity. Um, and then I went to go do my administrator and training program, and I did that with one of my father's um, uh, professional partners at the time. He had nursing homes in Tyler. So I did that in Tyler, and then I leapt to um, taking my board exam. Um, and after that, I um, went to work for Beverly Enterprises. It was a large um, nursing home chain um, that was actually nationwide. Um, so I got a, a small 40 bed nursing home in Van, Texas, which is outside of Tyler. Um, and it was, I was really blessed to be again with a really great um, business office manager that had been at that community for 20 plus years. Plus um, the nurse had been at that community for over 20 years. So looking back on it, I thought, you know, wow, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I've been doing this for so many years. I know what I'm doing. And they were so kind because I was 24 years old and that they hired me at 24 to go in and run a nursing home. Looking back on it, they must have been just desperate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who, you know, would have, and, and I'm thinking I'm all that and, and bless those staff for not having an uproar that you hired us, what? <laughs> you're, you're bringing who? Um, and I remember when I first started, I got the petty cash check from corporate and I took it to the bank to cash. And the, the teller, you know, is, is looking at me and saying, well, honey, you're going to have to have your administrator come down here and cash this check. And I said, well, I am the administrator. And <laughs> She didn't believe me. Um, and so she had to call the community where Doris was. And I remember Doris to this day. And and Doris is like, yep, that's who they sent us. <laughs> it's, it was like you were being carded to buy liquor. Oh, I, I know. And so I thought, um, you know, and I, and I, I made it there for nine months. Um, and then I was luckily, you know, kind of given birth. And I was uh, found uh, transferred to one of the larger communities in Dallas. But it, you know, each of those moments shapes you. And then um, had moved forward, got married, and continued to work with them. And then in the future, went back and helped my family. And then I moved on to Sunrise um, Assisted Living. And um, before, I had just done skilled nursing, um, a stint in geriatric psych. Um, probably people don't want to know about my resume, um, but really getting into assisted living, they didn't want to hire me because they didn't want to bring that clinical um, thought process and they really wanted it hospitality. And I have never worked so hard to get a job in my life for something that was going to pay so much less than what I was getting paid. Um, but it was a different atmosphere. It was really like working in a beautiful hotel versus working in a, a, a hospital nursing home environment. Um, and my son was four at the time. And uh, when I got that job, it was just the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, and it really taught me about customer service. And I, I was so excited that we were now having choice. 
that people didn't always just, you didn't have any other place to go when I was younger. You know, when, when you got old and your family couldn't take care of you, you went to the place around the corner and whether it was clean or it was dirty or it had a good reputation or a terrible reputation, you were kind of stuck. Um, so, you know, I, I was so excited that, you know, good grief, there's, there's 50 different kinds of pop tarts. Thank goodness. Now there's 50 different kinds of senior living and we can choose what kind of community um, fits, fits our lifestyle. And so that is what I'm so happy to have seen over the course of my career. Is it going from you get what you get when you get it to you'll get what you want when you want it. Yes. And, and you know what I also love about your journey, Kendra, you got a very early, uh, almost an indoctrination into mm -hmm. this industry at seven years old. So a little further down the line, it makes sense to me why at 24 years old, which is incredibly young to become an executive director of a skilled nursing community facility. And then when they didn't want to hire you for the assisted living, it, 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 it's a very interesting pattern that I'm seeing here. That again, you were just meant to be wherever you were if that makes any sense at all no matter no, what you know you well. no matter what it looked like on paper no matter what your age was you you have a very definite bunch of footsteps to put your feet into mm -hmm. i love it thank you yeah so how did you um knock on rcm's door or did they knock on yours so they knocked on on my door a few times <laughs> So um, I, I was very fortunate to uh, manage a community in, in the Woodlands um, and uh, part through when I had worked with Sunrise and actually one of when we moved back to Texas, we were in Indiana with my husband's job, moved back to um, moved to Houston um, to the Woodlands and transferred with the company. And one of the first people that I met was Diane DeFrancisco, who is our senior VP. She was running a community in Houston. I was running the one in the Woodlands. Um, and so I, I remember my family hasn't, hadn't even transferred yet. And she was the first person I had dinner with. Um, so we kind of forged that, that, you know, that friendship and that, that coworker relationship. And we'd always kept in touch. Um, so later down the road, um, Jim Gray, uh, built a community in the woodlands and he was my fierce competitor <laughs> um and it was just beautiful and i'm just like oh my goodness and you know they were so kind to to and, and lynn to reach out uh, to see if i had um, any interest in jumping ship and at that time my team had been with me for such a long time and i was really embodied um, and married to that building um, and and loved it so I just, I couldn't, I couldn't make the change then. And Lynn came back again. I said, no, it's just, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm happy where I am. And I'm not a change person. I mean, when I stick, they'll probably, they're now they're probably stuck with me unless they fire me. Um, I don't so, think it's going to happen. Yeah, I'm, I, I just, I try to forge deep relationships and, and I, I truly have a lot of loyalty. I think that's another thing that my family taught is that, um, you know, you, you bring, loyalty and love and honor to to whoever you work for whether it's your family or someone else as long as we're aligned in um you know doing the right thing um and and that's one thing i love about rcm and and jim and dave and just the integrity and the honesty that they bring to it so fast forward um kind of you know lose track of them i decided to take on a regional role with uh with brookdale um, as an op specialist and I'm traveling around. I'm loving it. Um, I'm getting to go to Tennessee. I'm going to all these different places. I've been working out of Austin and meeting so many wonderful people. And it was such a great experience and such good people um, that they were to me. So I wasn't looking to leave. I was very happy where I was. Um, and here comes Diane knocking on my door <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, I haven't talked to you in so long. And I remember, um, it was in an evening, I'm, I'm you know, in uh, Georgetown, Tennessee, and she said, hey, have an opportunity. And I'm like, oh, you know, I always thought a, a lot of uh, Lynn and Diane and, and Jim Gray, and I said, well, tell me more. 
so we kept talking. And so the next time I came back into town, um, you know, I came down and, and had um, time to visit with Diane and got to meet Dave uh, for the first time. And I was, I think I was just so excited that it was the first time since my family that I was going to work for something that really wasn't publicly traded. And I had a seat at the table, you know, Dave was going to listen to me and Diane was going to listen to me and um, Jim was going to care about what I thought. Um, so I really felt like, you know, I, I might be able to, you know, enhance what they're doing and support. So I just thought it was going to be a good, good opportunity. So I took the leap um, and I am three years later. I am so glad that I did. And it's been such a, a wonderful experience in family and there's been challenges, but there's also been tremendous growth um, and great collaboration with different companies, um, with our owners. And I'm, I'm just, every day I learn something new and every day I make a, some mistake and I just dust myself off and learn and keep moving. And I think that's what we have to do is keep learning. You bet. Doris Day was a big champion of that. A famous quote of hers is, hey, you know what? If something terrible happens, you don't stay down. You don't stay defeated. You get up, you dust yourself off, you put your boots back on, and you keep moving forward. And, and you really are a champion of that. And also, I kept hearing one word uh, often in, in the explanation <laughs> you just gave. And really, to me, this word has come up every time when I I've interviewed an RCM executive staff person, and that word is family. Uh, and, and you started mentioning it around seven years of age when you shared that part of your journey with us, and I heard you say it all the way through. And what I'm getting from all of you that I'm interviewing for this wonderful series is that really, uh, RCM, no matter how big it gets, it's always going to keep that family energy, that family connection. And if that exists between all of you in the, in the corporate executive staff, then of course it filters down to everybody at all of the RCM communities. And then people who come in thinking about living at an RCM community will really feel that when they walk in the door before they even get to the reception desk. So really kudos to you and really everybody I'm interviewing in this series because I didn't say a word about family until all of you say it, you know? And, and that's proof that that is one of the credos of, of how you guys approach your, your job, really your mission each mm -hmm. and every day. Um, so Kendra, what is, uh, is the job description of a chief operating officer with RCM? Um, so I think, you know, overall in the job description, obviously it's, it's you know, ensuring that our day-to-day -day operations are, um, you know, yes, we need to follow policies and we need to follow procedures. Um, we have standards and we have best practices. Um, so I, I think when I think of chief operating officer, it's kind of chief cheerleader. Um, yes, there's accountability. So it's coaching and cheerleading. Um, it's really making sure that you have all the tools and the training and the support to do your job, but the accountability to say at the end of the day, you need to do your job. Um, and I, I always take that really to heart because, um, you know, I run every day when I make those decisions, I balance it in two ways. One is I balance it as a daughter. If I needed to make, how is this decision going to impact my mother and my father? If they lived in our communities, is this what I would want for them? So that's balancing act number one. Balancing act number two is I think back to when I was that... Um, nurse assistant. And, you know, I remember those conversations in the break room. And, you know, I remember how we felt or how we didn't feel appreciated or just somebody simply saying thank you or, you know, can that nurse please get up from the nurse's station and come down and help me answer the call lines. Um, I remember, you know, how, how I felt, you know, and, and way back when I started, I remember my first paycheck, I made $3.05 an hour. <laughs> I don't know if that was even legal, um, but, or that just really tells my age. Um, 
but it was, it, it was really ingrained at me. So even now, when we're looking at a policy, we're looking at a procedure, we're looking at an initiative, I balance it in those two ways. Um, it has to lick the test that it would be good for, for my mom and my dad, so for the seniors that we serve, um, but it's also gotta be good for our staff. And it's got to honor them and make sure that they have the tools and the training that they can do that. And then ultimately at the very end, you know, it comes down to most of what our staff do. I, I would like to say that I'm a genius. I'm not, <laughs> um, you know, I, I can learn, I can read, I can, you know, implement policies, but at the, you know, at the end of the day, you have to have the passion. And if you don't care, I can't teach you that. Um, so with that, I can teach you how to make a bed. Um, I probably can't teach you how to cook. I'm not that great at it, but you know, we can teach you to do everything because you're probably doing it in your own home. Now we're just doing it for others. So I can't teach you to care about that. And I can't teach you to put a smile on your face and to truly enjoy serving others. And so when I'm having not a great day, um, you know, I could always leave the office and I could go out and engage with our residents and it immediately, I got my groove back. It, it cheered me up. I could go out and I could visit with our care associates. I could visit with our cooks and our, and our servers and I, it energized me and I could get through that day and I could get through that moment and I could reset my course and I could continue to live my mission. Um, and people that drown in self-pity and having to serve yourself it's never going to be a good recipe at RCM. So I, I want people that have that passion and we will make mistakes and we will, um, you know, have to change course if we find that something didn't work as well as we thought it did, but we have a ton of forgiveness for ourselves. Uh, we want to continue to innovate, but we want people that come to us that are problem solvers and they're like, Oh, I have a passion to want to make this better instead of getting sucked into, you know, doom and gloom and, you know, we can't make this work. So that's, I think, what truly sucks my energy out is people that like to cause the problem. They don't like to forge the solution. Mm, yes. Oh, my goodness. So many gems and pearls of, of wisdom that you just shared in that. I, I think one of the most important things I heard you say was passion. You know, if, if you don't have a passion for who you are and what you do, and how you can serve others with that passion, then you're, you're just sort of stuck in the water. And so to me, it sounds like your passion is what fuels you. And then people who you serve um, will feel that from you as a prime motivator. I, I just love it. Your, your mindset uh, for getting the job done every day seems to be so connected with who you are at a heart level mm -hmm. uh, to me it's it's just very impressive and i can see why you do what you do so well so kudos to you thank you no i'm serious it's it's in, in <clears throat> i even hate to use that word uh, in the corporate world uh, right. of today it's very rare that you find people in your position and, and other executive positions, let's say at RCM, who have the family energy, who uh, operate from their heart instead of their head all the time, who understand what passion is and how to share that. So mm -hmm. I, I find that in each one of you, and it's just personally very impressive to me. Um, just a couple more questions, Kendra. Next one. Where do you see RCM going? Um, you know, I, I hope, um, you know, as far as going, as far as the business, um, you know, I know that, that Jim and Dave, we, we would really like to grow and serve others. We don't want to be the biggest. Um, we just want to be the best. So, you know, how many communities that will be, you know, at some point we'd say, when that's enough. Um, let, let's do what we really do well. And, you know, I love that we have so many different parts of our portfolio. Um, I think that's one of the things I find most challenging is we have everything from a small 16 unit um, memory care cottage that feels very much like your house. 
beautiful courtyards. Um, when Dave and I walked him for the first time, we, we both were just marbled and thought, what a beautiful concept. Um, and honestly, if, if my family had had memory loss, it is something I would really highly consider because it feels like, you know, you're, you're not, you, there's just so much personal attention. Um, and then we have others that are the brand new high rises. Um, we have the carriage inns um, in Village on the Parks that are, you know, ranch style, um, you know, one story and they have such character. Um, and they're so well known in their in their neighborhoods. So I, I think what I just really love is the diversity of the different for, portfolios that we share and hoping to see that grow and maybe in markets that we haven't served before. So we get to to serve even more more people. So, you know, I think hopefully that that's where um, we grow from size wise um, from a culture standpoint. You know, I, I really want to keep staying the course, but um, we know that we want to continue to improve and innovate on our training programs. Um, one of the things that um, I'm so excited about, and Diane and, and Dave are, are helping me lead the charge, is, you know, developing people who were like me. And Diane also started um, at a very young age, and there were people that took a risk for us. Um, you know, there weren't a lot of people that would probably be willing to give a 24 year old a shot at running a multi-million dollar business. Um, and you know, if we, as we develop our executive director and training program is I, I want to start developing cause we have some phenomenal, um, employees in our company and smart. I've got one gentleman that I, um, have working in a community and he's the, he's the day shift concierge and you know answering phones and I, I just spoke to him one day and you know tell me about yourself what are your hopes and your dreams and tell me about your background he's got a bachelor's degree in communications and i said well you know why are you working at, at the front desk you 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 know got the world you know at your feet and he's just trying to get in and find his way and i really see that that's where i want rcm to grow is to help these gems to, to grow and find their way when they have a passion for senior living, they were just like me and couldn't articulate it at a young age, but now I know what to look for. Um, so if we can start to develop and bring these young people out of college, and you see, especially right now with COVID, um, you know, what, when industries are thriving through anything, you know, healthcare doesn't go away. Um, we have to, we have to, to mold, we have to change, we have to innovate, but, we need to go after these high school, I mean, uh, these high school and college graduates and to say, come to us. If you have a passion for serving people, you know, get out of that driver's line at Chick-fil-A and come work for us and let us start that path. So that's really where I want to see us grow is through developing people. And then whether they go off and work at other companies or not, you know, look at the legacy of of what it does for RCM, but look at the residents that are going to benefit from that training and that support and really lifting people up. I love that. I love that. You know, uh, however RCM decides to proceed concerning the future with people like you and and these other wonderful executives that it's been my honor to continue to interview. Uh, that are a part of this company. I, I think the future is very secure because you and, and the rest of your team uh, are bringing core values with you. And they're very honest values. They're not something that's just bullet points on a piece of paper, they're real. And, and they come from a very honest and true place, understanding the true value of customer service and what it really is to be in service to your fellow human being, your fellow resident, your fellow staff member, your fellow uh, VP, you know, and that's, that's a, a winning formula, a winning formula. So it brings us to the last and final question because uh, there are a lot of residents watching. I know there are a lot of staff that will probably watch. Uh, there are uh, other members of the executive team who are watching this, but for the residents, Kendra, um, if you, and I know you're very visible 
at, at many RCM communities. So I know a lot of them know you and recognize you. Uh, but even for those who don't, if you could give them a message right here and now from your heart to theirs, what would that be? Oh, you know, I, I think it'd be the same message that um, I give my mom. My mom's now in assisted living um, and she's actually in our families. Um, community so she's kind of the matriarch so she's kind of mad when she doesn't get her way all the time <laughs> um, so I think um, you know every resident is an individual and you shouldn't lose your individuality and you know we don't have to go around and pound square pegs into round holes um, the thing that I, I love about senior living is remember that this is for you um, that we are here to serve you. Um, you're not here to serve us. Um, you know, yes, there's some things we have to streamline. So, um, you know, we'll continue to work and innovate things, but we want to do things like I, I do for my mom is when do you want it? Um, if she's not a big bingo player, she don't want to play bingo. Um, but you know, she likes other activities. So she just likes sitting out in the living room and visiting. So they have kind of a sit and sip. So I think, you know, is the thing that I tell her most is as difficult as change is, especially if you're new to coming into senior living as it was for her, is, you know, this, the place is your house. Your apartment is a place for rest, reflection, and that quiet time. But, but don't live in there. Go out. There are so many people that you don't have to enjoy bingo with 50 people, but if you can find that neighbor who may be lonely um, and just want that one friend, and that's what happened with my mom. I said, mom, just go find one friend. And she, her best friend, Betty, lives across the hallway. And, you know, they sit together at lunch every day. Um, they know what each other likes and they check on each other. Um, you know, they, they check. And if something's wrong or not right, um, you know, they're calling both of us daughters. So I, I would just say, please extend your world outside your apartment, look for that friend um, and enjoy every day. And if there's something you don't like, it's okay to complain. And I tell my mom that all the time. We don't take it as complaining. We say, if we don't know, we can't fix it. So if you can please trust us, to tell us, I didn't like that chicken. It was a little tough. I didn't like the way we always call it the big green bean controversy. Is it too crunchy or is it too mushy? <laughs> tell us. Um, some people like it crunchy, some people like it mushy. So some days we'll make it mushy and some days we'll make it crunchy. <laughs> but we, we want that conversation. We want you to trust us to say, here's what I like and here's what I don't like. So here's what I want you to start doing. Here's what I want you to stop doing. And here's what I want you to continue to do. Um, and that we're a community. And when we all communicate, you know, I think when I was an executive director and I talked with our executive directors, we're just the mayor of the town. And so you need to tell your mayor what, what, you, what you need. And we will do everything we can to try to please it or to try to find a solution. It may not be exactly the way that you want it or as much as you want, but at least if we can engage in that conversation, be heard, um, we, can, we can make tomorrow a better day. Mm. Wow. Beautifully said. I feel like I just want to take that in for a few minutes. <laughs> but uh, beautif beautifully said, Kendra. I mean, you, you, you said a lot there. And, and I think this is a perfect place to conclude our time with you. I really want to thank you so much for your sincerity, your honesty, and your passion. Thank you so much, Kendra. All right. Thanks. And thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening for so long. Oh, no. I think it, it, if it is just me, uh, if I could respond to that, every word you said was more than worthwhile. Oh, thank you, Robert. I appreciate the time. Yes, yes. And with that, this has been Robert Landau, Live Life Well TV host, and we will see you next episode.